Ancient Japan, with its rich history and culture, has fascinated us for centuries. Among the most iconic figures from this time are the samurai, an elite warrior class who lived by a strict code of honor and discipline. Today we're going to explore the unique traditions and lifestyle of the samurai, delving into what it meant to be a samurai in ancient Japan. We'll also take a look at the remarkable engineering and architectural innovations of the time, along with other intriguing aspects of ancient Japanese society. So let's step back in time and immerse ourselves in the world of ancient Japan. Welcome to life's biggest questions. Now let's continue. To delve deeper into the world of the samurai, let's first take a look at the broader historical context of ancient Japan. The Heian period, 794-1185 CE, marked a significant turning point for Japan, with the establishment of the imperial capital in Kyoto, then called Heian Kyo, and the flourishing of the arts and literature. It was also during this time that the samurai emerged as a distinct warrior class, protecting the interests of their noble patrons and playing a crucial role in the power struggles that shaped Japan's political landscape. As Japan moved into the Kamakura, 1185 to 1333 CE, and Muromachi, 1336 to 1573 CE periods, the role of the samurai continued to evolve. The establishment of the first shogunate or military government in Kamakura marked the beginning of a new era where the samurai class held significant political power. This shift in power dynamics set the stage for the rise of prominent samurai clans such as the Taira, Minamoto, and later the Ashikaga. The samurai's role in society extended far beyond the battlefield. As members of the ruling class, they were expected to be well-versed in poetry, literature, and the arts. The tale of Genji, often regarded as the world's first novel, was written during the Heian period by Lady Murasaki Shikibu and was widely read and appreciated among the samurai class. This emphasis on cultural refinement set the samurai apart from other warrior classes throughout history illustrating the unique blend of martial prowess and intellectual pursuits that characterized the samurai way of life. In addition to their martial and cultural roles, the samurai also played an essential part in shaping Japan's legal system. The development of the Gosebai Shikimoku or the formulary of adjudications in 1232 during the Kamakura period was a crucial step in codifying the laws and practices that governed samurai society. This legal code established a set of principles that guided the samurai's conduct both on and off the battlefield, and further reinforced the importance of Bujido in the daily lives of these elite warriors. The world of the samurai was steeped in tradition, with various unique customs and rituals shaping their daily lives. These practices were not only integral to the samurai's personal growth and development, but also served to strengthen the bonds within their communities and reinforce their commitment to the principles of Bushido. One such tradition was the practice of meditation, which allowed samurai to cultivate mental clarity, self-discipline and emotional resilience. By developing their ability to remain focused and present in the face of adversity, samurai warriors were able to maintain a heightened sense of awareness on the battlefield and make strategic decisions under pressure. In addition to meditation, the samurai also engaged in rigorous physical training, known as keiko, which included martial arts disciplines such as kendo, kudo, and jujitsu. These practices not only honed the samurai's physical prowess, but also reinforced the spiritual and mental aspects of their training. The concept of mushin, or no mind, was particularly important in these disciplines, as it encouraged the samurai to act instinctively and without hesitation in the heat of battle. Another fascinating samurai tradition was the practice of ikebana, or Japanese flower arrangement. This art form emphasized the harmonious arrangement of flowers, branches, and other natural elements, fostering a deep appreciation for nature and its inherent beauty. For the samurai, the practice of ikebana was more than just a creative outlet. It was a means of cultivating a sense of balance and tranquility, which was essential to their success as warriors. Samurai also had a unique relationship with poetry, particularly the traditional Japanese form known as tanka. Composed of five lines with a syllable pattern of 57577, tanka poetry was a means for samurai to express their thoughts and emotions in a concise and elegant manner. In many cases, samurai would engage in friendly poetry competitions, known as yuta awais, 
as a way of honing their literary skills and fostering camaraderie among their peers. The practice of yabusame or horseback archery was another unique samurai tradition that required great skill, concentration and discipline. The samurai would train rigorously to develop the ability to shoot accurately while riding at high speeds, demonstrating their mastery of both horsemanship and archery. Yabusame events were often held as ceremonial demonstrations, with samurai showcasing their prowess in front of their lords and fellow warriors. The samurai were renowned for their mastery of various weapons, each with its unique characteristics and uses on the battlefield. While the katana is perhaps the most iconic of these weapons, samurai were also skilled in the use of a range of other arms, which played an essential role in their martial prowess. One such weapon was the yumi, a traditional Japanese longbow which was a key component of the samurai's arsenal. The yumi was asymmetric, with a lower grip to accommodate shooting from horseback. Archery was considered a highly honorable skill, and samurai trained rigorously to become expert marksmen, able to hit targets with incredible accuracy even at long distances. Another notable weapon was the naginata, a polearm with a curved blade at the end. The naginata was particularly effective in close combat situations, allowing the wielder to strike with considerable force while maintaining a safe distance from their opponent. This weapon was also popular among samurai women, who were trained in its use for self-defense and to protect their homes in times of conflict. Samurai also employed the use of the Tanto, a short dagger used primarily for close quarters combat and in ritual suicide or seppuku. The Tanto was often carried alongside the katana, providing the samurai with a versatile secondary weapon when needed. The armor worn by samurai was meticulously crafted to provide maximum protection without sacrificing mobility. The design of this armor evolved over time, reflecting changes in warfare and the specific needs of the samurai class. Early samurai armor known as o -O Yoroi was characterized by large boxy cuirasses and helmets adorned with intricate ornamentation. However, as warfare shifted toward more infantry-based combat, the armor design changed to become more flexible and lightweight, resulting in the development of the Domaru and later the Tose Gusoko. Samurai armor was typically made from a combination of materials including iron, leather and silk, which were carefully layered and laced together to create a highly effective, protective garment. The helmet, or kabuto, was a particularly important component of the samurai's armor, often featuring elaborate crests and decorations that signified the wearer's rank and family lineage. One striking aspect of samurai armor was its aesthetic appeal. Each piece of armor was carefully crafted and often adorned with intricate designs, reflecting the wearer's personal taste and status. This attention to detail extended even to the smallest components, such as the fittings on the sword scabbard, which were often made from precious metals and featured intricate carvings and inlays. Ancient Japan was home to a wealth of engineering and architectural innovations, which have left a lasting impact on the nation's landscape and cultural identity. These advances not only demonstrated the ingenuity and resourcefulness of the Japanese people, but also played a crucial role in shaping the nation's political, economic and social development. One of the most iconic architectural achievements of ancient Japan was the construction of castles, which served as the fortified residences of powerful samurai lords. Japanese castle design was heavily influenced by the needs of the samurai class, with a focus on defensive capabilities and adaptability to the nation's varied terrain. Japanese castles were typically built on strategic hilltops, surrounded by a series of concentric walls and moats to provide multiple layers of defense. The central keep, or tenshu, was the heart of the castle, housing the lord's living quarters and serving as a symbol of his authority. Castles were designed to make use of the natural landscape for defense, incorporating elements such as cliffs, rivers and ravines to create a formidable fortress. One unique feature of Japanese castle design was the use of stone foundations, which supported the wooden structures above. These foundations, known as Ishiotoshi, were carefully constructed using large, irregularly shaped stones, which were expertly fitted together without the use of mortar. This technique allowed the foundations to flex and shift during earthquakes, providing greater stability and resilience to these wooden structures. Ancient Japan was also home to a number of impressive religious structures, such as the Todaiji Temple in Nara. This temple, 
which houses the world's largest bronze statue of the Buddha, was constructed in the 8th century using a unique method of interlocking wooden beams known as Kanawatsugi. This technique allowed the massive structure to be built without the use of nails, creating a flexible and earthquake-resistant framework that has stood the test of time. Japanese gardens were another area where engineering and architectural ingenuity were on display. These carefully designed spaces were intended to evoke a sense of tranquility and harmony with nature, often incorporating elements such as ponds, bridges and carefully placed rocks to create a balanced and visually appealing landscape. The use of shakki, or borrowed scenery, was a key concept in Japanese garden design as it allowed the garden to incorporate distant natural features, such as mountains or trees, into the overall composition. The ancient Japanese were also skilled in the construction of wooden bridges, which were essential for traversing the nation's many rivers and streams. One notable example is the Kintai Bridge, which was built in the 17th century and features a series of five wooden arches. This unique design allowed the bridge to withstand floods and other natural disasters, while also providing an aesthetically pleasing focal point for the surrounding landscape. One interesting aspect of ancient Japan was the development of its writing system. The Japanese language initially had no written form, but with the introduction of Chinese characters known as kanji in the 4th century, Japan began to develop a unique writing system. Over time, two phonetic scripts, hiragana and katakana, emerged, allowing for greater flexibility and expression in written Japanese. This combination of kanji, hiragana and katakana formed the basis of the Japanese writing system, which is still in use today. The No theater is another fascinating aspect of ancient Japanese culture. No is a form of classical Japanese drama that combines music, dance and drama in a highly stylized and ritualized manner. Originating in the 14th century, No plays often feature supernatural themes and explore the boundaries between the mortal and spiritual realms. The performances are characterized by their slow, deliberate movements and the use of intricately carved wooden masks, which serve to enhance the actor's expressions and convey deep emotions. In the realm of cuisine, ancient Japan developed a unique culinary tradition that emphasized simplicity, seasonality, and an appreciation for natural flavors. The foundation of Japanese cuisine is based on the principle of Ichiju Sansai, which translates to one soup, three dishes. This concept revolves around the idea of a balanced meal, consisting of a soup, a main dish, usually fish or meat, and two side dishes accompanied by rice and pickles. This principle is still at the heart of Japanese cuisine today, emphasizing harmony and balance in both flavor and presentation. Have you ever wondered how ancient civilizations have shaped the world we know today? Well, buckle up, because we're about to embark on a journey through ancient China, a land of mystique, ingenuity, and awe-inspiring accomplishments. From the formidable skills of ninjas to the magnificent architecture that has withstood the test of time, we'll delve into a fascinating world that's full of surprises. Along the way, we'll uncover the countless innovations and inventions that originated in ancient China and have left an indelible mark on human history. So let's dive in and explore the wonders of this incredible civilization. Ancient China boasts one of the world's oldest and most remarkable civilizations with its history spanning back to around 1600 BCE during the Shang Dynasty. Over the centuries, numerous dynasties have ruled China, each leaving their unique mark on the culture, society and advancements of the time. The rich tapestry of ancient Chinese history includes the famous Zhou Dynasty with its enduring philosophical ideas, the unification of China under the Qin Dynasty and the prosperous Han Dynasty that saw the flourishing of trade along the Silk Road. Ancient China's society was deeply rooted in the concept of Confucianism, a philosophical system emphasizing the importance of ethics, social harmony and respect for authority. Confucian values shaped the structure of Chinese society, guiding relationships between family members, friends and rulers. This emphasis on order and harmony is also evident in other aspects of Chinese culture, such as art, music and architecture. Religion played a significant role in ancient China, with a mix of indigenous beliefs such as ancestor worship and imported ideas like Buddhism coexisting and influencing each other. The Chinese also practiced Taoism, a philosophical and religious tradition that emphasized living in harmony with the Tao, the natural order of the universe. 
The ancient Chinese were also keen observers of the natural world, developing sophisticated systems of astronomy and meteorology. They created detailed star maps, observed celestial events such as comets and solar eclipses, and even established a lunar calendar that is still in use today. In the next segment, we'll delve into the martial arts and warrior traditions of ancient China, which played a pivotal role in shaping the nation's history and inspiring legendary warriors like the Japanese ninjas. Martial arts have been deeply rooted in Chinese culture for thousands of years, with their origins dating back to the Xia and Shang dynasties. These ancient fighting techniques evolved over time, influenced by Chinese philosophies, religion, and the ever-changing needs of warfare and self-defense. During the spring and autumn period, 771-476 BCE, and the Warring States period, 475-221 BCE, China was divided into numerous rival states constantly at war with each other. These conflicts spurred the development of various martial arts styles focusing on different aspects of combat such as hand-to-hand -hand fighting, archery, and horseback riding. The influence of ancient Chinese philosophy, particularly Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, played a significant role in shaping the principles of martial arts. For example, Taoism emphasized the importance of balance and harmony, leading to the development of Tai Chi, a martial art focused on fluid, slow movements and inner peace. Confucianism, on the other hand, stressed the importance of discipline and loyalty, which translated into the strict training regimens and codes of conduct for martial artists. One of the most famous martial arts to emerge from ancient China is Kung Fu, also known as Wushu. Kung Fu incorporates a wide range of techniques, including kicks, punches, throws, joint locks, and weapons training. Its practitioners often imitated the movements of animals, such as the tiger, crane, or snake, to develop effective and powerful fighting styles. Ancient Chinese warriors, such as the legendary Shaolin monks, were renowned for their martial arts skills, discipline, and spiritual dedication. Although ninjas were Japanese, their origins can be traced back to the martial arts techniques and philosophies that originated in ancient China. It's worth noting that Chinese martial arts also influenced other warrior traditions in Asia, such as the Korean Huarang and the Japanese Samurai. Martial arts were not only practiced by warriors and soldiers, they were also embraced by scholars, monks and common people who sought to cultivate their physical and mental well-being. Today, Chinese martial arts continue to be practiced worldwide, serving as a testament to the enduring influence of ancient Chinese culture and its warrior traditions. The architecture of ancient China is a testament to the country's rich history, cultural diversity and ingenuity. Over the centuries, Chinese architects developed distinctive styles and techniques characterized by their emphasis on balance, symmetry and harmony. Influenced by Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist principles, Chinese architecture reflects the integration of aesthetics, functionality, and spirituality. One of the most iconic architectural features of ancient China is the use of wooden construction. Skilled craftsmen developed intricate joinery techniques, enabling them to build large, complex structures without the use of nails or glue. This approach allowed for flexibility, making buildings more resistant to earthquakes and other natural disasters. Additionally, the wooden framework made it easy to dismantle and reassemble structures, allowing for efficient repairs and renovations. Roofs played a significant role in Chinese architecture, with their sweeping curves and upturned eaves symbolizing protection and shelter. Roof tiles were typically made from glazed ceramic, with vibrant colors and intricate patterns reflecting the status of the building's owner. The Forbidden City in Beijing, home to the emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasties, is an excellent example of this grand architectural style. Chinese architecture also incorporated the principles of feng shui, an ancient practice that seeks to harmonize the energy flow within a space by carefully considering its orientation, layout, and design elements. This holistic approach to architecture aimed to create environments that promoted well-being, prosperity, and positive energy. Ancient China's architectural achievements were not limited to palaces and temples. They also excelled in building defensive structures and infrastructure. The Great Wall of China, stretching over 13,000 miles, 
is an incredible feat of engineering and construction, designed to protect the country from invasions. Meanwhile, the Grand Canal, the world's longest and oldest artificial waterway, facilitated trade and transportation between the north and south of China. In the next segment, we'll explore the numerous innovations and inventions that emerged from ancient China, shaping the world in ways that still resonate today. Ancient China was a powerhouse of innovation, responsible for many groundbreaking inventions that have shaped the world and continue to impact our daily lives. The ingenuity of the ancient Chinese is evident across various fields, including agriculture, medicine, warfare and the arts. One of the most significant inventions in ancient China was the development of paper. During the Han Dynasty around 105 CA, a court official named Kai Lun created a process to make paper from mulberry bark and other plant fibers. This revolutionary invention allowed for the spread of knowledge, literature and art, ultimately transforming communication and record-keeping across the world. Another crucial innovation was the invention of gunpowder. Initially developed by Taoist alchemists seeking the elixir of immortality, gunpowder quickly found its way into military applications. The Chinese used gunpowder to create rockets, bombs and firearms, forever changing the nature of warfare. The ancient Chinese also pioneered the production of silk, a luxurious and highly prized fabric. The secret of silk production, known as sericulture, was closely guarded for centuries, ensuring China's monopoly on the global silk trade. Uh, the Silk Road, a network of trade routes connecting China to the Mediterranean, facilitated the exchange of silk, spices and other valuable goods between the East and the West, fostering cultural and economic connections that would shape the course of history. In the field of agriculture, the ancient Chinese developed advanced irrigation systems, such as the Dujiangyan irrigation system, which dates back to the 3rd century BCE. This impressive feat of engineering harnessed the power of the Min River to irrigate vast areas of farmland, ensuring reliable food production and reducing the impact of floods and droughts. The ancient Chinese also made significant contributions to astronomy, mathematics and medicine. They were among the first to use a magnetic compass for navigation, and their development of the Abacus revolutionized mathematical calculations. In medicine, Chinese practitioners developed a holistic approach to health, incorporating herbal remedies, acupuncture and massage techniques that are still practiced today. These are just a few examples of the countless innovations and inventions that emerged from ancient China. Their impact has been felt across the globe and throughout history, leaving a lasting legacy that continues to inspire awe and admiration. And there you have it, a whirlwind tour of ancient China's remarkable legacy. From the intricate art of martial arts and warrior traditions to the breathtaking architecture that still inspires us today, we've explored the many facets of this ancient civilization that continue to shape our modern world. The innovative spirit and resourcefulness of the ancient Chinese have given us inventions like paper, gunpowder and silk, proving that their impact is far-reaching and enduring. As we continue to marvel at the achievements of the past, we can only wonder what other secrets and lessons this fascinating civilization still has to offer. Have you ever looked up at the stars and wondered how our ancestors interpreted these celestial bodies? What if I told you there was a civilization that not only gazed at the cosmos, but wrote sophisticated texts that connected life, nature and the universe in one profound framework? This was the Vedic civilization, a culture that emerged around the same time when the pyramids were being built in Egypt, but halfway across the world in the Indian subcontinent. Their fascinating contributions to astronomy, philosophy and mathematics are still evident in modern society, yet their beliefs and lore seem to intertwine with other ancient civilizations, even hinting at advanced technologies and extraterrestrial connections. So let's embark on a journey into the past to a time when the Vedas were being composed and uncover the intriguing world of the Vedic civilization. The Vedic civilization is named after the Vedas, which are the oldest scriptures in Hindu literature. But these are not just religious texts, they are in many ways a window into the culture, science and philosophy of a society that thrived between 1500 and 500 BC. A significant component of ancient Indian society, the Vedic civilization spanned across the northern and northwestern parts of India, covering the modern-day states of Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and parts of Rajasthan. 
The Vedic civilization's chronology itself is intriguing. Its beginning coincides with the end of the Indus Valley civilization, leading some to suggest that the Vedic people might have been the successors of the Indus Valley people. Others suggest that they were entirely distinct entities, with the Vedic civilization being pastoral and nomadic compared to the urban, settled life of the Indus Valley civilization. However, it's clear that both civilizations were remarkably advanced for their time. The civilization gets its name from the four Vedas, Rigveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda, and Atharvaveda. These texts are a collection of hymns, rituals, and chants used in religious rites and ceremonies. The texts are written in Sanskrit, and they provide valuable insights into the societal structure, economic practices, and philosophical beliefs of the Vedic people. But they also contain some intriguing elements that have sparked debates among scholars and enthusiasts alike. References to advanced astronomical knowledge, mentions of flying machines or vimanas, and sophisticated metallurgical practices raise questions about how much the Vedic civilization knew and understood. Some argue that these elements point towards ancient technology, possibly even interaction with extraterrestrial intelligence, while others interpret them as metaphors or religious symbolism. The debate continues, making the Vedic civilization an endless source of intrigue and fascination. The Vedic civilization has left an indelible mark on the world, and its influence continues to shape our modern lives in ways that we may not even recognize. We owe a great deal of our understanding of early philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, and health sciences to this ancient civilization. Take, for instance, the concept of zero. Today, we take it for granted, but it was during the Vedic period that mathematicians began grappling with this revolutionary concept, changing the course of mathematics forever. Vedic astronomy was equally advanced. The texts detail a deep understanding of celestial mechanics. The Vedas describe how the Earth revolves around the Sun, a fact that was only widely accepted much later in human history. They also mention Vimanas, which many interpret as references to flying machines causing speculations about possible advanced technology or even ancient aviation. The health sciences also saw significant advancements during the Vedic period. The Rigveda and Atharva Veda mention numerous plants and herbs used for medicinal purposes, marking the early beginnings of Ayurveda, one of the world's oldest holistic healing systems. Yoga, a practice that is now globally recognized for promoting physical and mental well-being, also finds its roots in the Vedic civilization. In terms of societal contributions, the Vedic civilization also pioneered the caste system, an intricate social structure that has shaped Indian society for centuries. While controversial in its implications, it provides unique insights into the cultural and social organization of the time. Of course, the spiritual philosophy of the Vedas has had a profound influence, forming the foundation for Hinduism and inspiring later philosophies like Buddhism and Jainism. The teachings emphasize the pursuit of knowledge, the harmony of the individual and the cosmos, and the principles of dharma, righteousness, artha, wealth, karma, desire, and moksha, liberation, desire. However, some elements of the Vedas have sparked lively debates. References to advanced technologies and knowledge that seems beyond the scope of a civilization from that era have led some to theorize about extraterrestrial involvement or connections with other ancient civilizations. When we start to dig into the intricacies of the Vedic civilization, we uncover striking resemblances to other ancient cultures, suggesting possible connections or shared influences. One of the most intriguing of these is the connection to ancient Egypt. Both civilizations flourished around the same time and shared surprisingly similar practices. For instance, the concept of Mart in Egyptian civilization closely mirrors the Vedic principle of Artai, both denoting cosmic order and moral law. Furthermore, both civilizations demonstrated advanced knowledge of astronomy. For instance, the Egyptian pyramids and Vedic structures both show a high level of astronomical alignment. Was this merely a coincidence, or was there a shared underlying knowledge that spanned these civilizations? The connection to ancient Sumer is also noteworthy. The Rig Veda, one of the oldest texts of the Vedic civilization, mentions River Saraswati, which is believed to be the present-day Gagahakra River. Interestingly, Sumerian texts also refer to a river similar to the Saraswati, indicating possible interactions between these civilizations. 
Another fascinating connection is seen in the similarities between the ancient Harappan symbols and the later Brahmi script used in the Vedic civilization. Could it be that knowledge was passed from one to the other? Perhaps one of the most intriguing theories, however, involves extraterrestrial influences. Some theories suggest that the knowledge and advancements of the Vedic civilization were influenced by alien civilizations, citing references to vimanas or flying machines in the ancient texts as evidence. While these connections are intriguing, it's important to approach them with a critical eye. The Vedic civilization, much like a supernova, may have had a relatively short lifespan compared to the cosmic scale of human history, but its impact continues to resonate even today. From the creation of Sanskrit, considered one of the oldest languages in the world and the mother of all Indo-European languages, to the foundational texts of Hindu philosophy, the Vedas, the civilization has left behind a cultural and intellectual legacy that is profound and enduring. Beyond language and religion, the Vedic civilization's contributions to science, particularly mathematics and astronomy, were remarkable. They conceptualized the idea of zero and developed a decimal system of counting, revolutionizing mathematical operations. In the realm of astronomy, they charted the movements of celestial bodies with striking accuracy, underlining a sophisticated understanding of the cosmos. These advancements are not only intriguing for their time, but continue to shape modern scientific thought and practices. The Vedic civilization's influence extended to social structures as well. The system of Varnas, a social hierarchy that would later evolve into the caste system, can trace its origins back to this civilization. While this has been a controversial legacy, it underscores the deep-seated influence of the Vedic civilization on the societal fabric of the Indian subcontinent. There are also fascinating yet controversial theories about the Vedic civilization's connection to ancient technology and even extraterrestrial life. References to Viminas, or flying machines in ancient texts, have sparked speculation about advanced, possibly alien technology. While these theories often skirt the realm of fringe science, they certainly add to the intrigue surrounding this civilization. As we delve deeper into the lore of the Vedic civilization, we find intriguing parallels and points of convergence with other ancient civilizations. One such connection arises with the Sumerians, one of the earliest civilizations in the world that sprouted in the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia. Like the Vedic civilization, the Sumerians had a pantheon of gods and they too were advanced in astronomical observations. Sumerian texts also speak of flying gods and chariots, which mirror the Vedic tales of Vimanas. Is it a coincidence that two distinct civilizations, separated by geography, came up with similar tales, or does it point towards a shared interaction with advanced technology, possibly extraterrestrial? Adding to the mystery are the theories postulating a connection between ancient civilizations and extraterrestrial beings. Ancient alien theorists propose that gods in both the Vedic and Sumerian pantheon were, in fact, advanced extraterrestrial beings who were mistaken as deities. They cite references to advanced technology, like the Vimanas in Vedic texts, and the detailed astronomical knowledge that far surpassed what would have been possible with the technology of the time. Furthermore, striking similarities in architectural designs, symbolism and religious rituals found across ancient civilizations have led to speculations of a shared ancient culture or a mother civilization. Some theories even suggest that this civilization could be the mythical city of Atlantis, which spread its knowledge across the world before it was lost to time. We've journeyed through millennia, across continents, and even ventured into the cosmos as we've explored the mysteries of the Vedic civilization. We've seen their incredible contributions, pondered their connections to other ancient civilizations, and even dared to question the possibility of ancient alien interactions. Whether or not these theories are true, they give us a deeper appreciation for the breadth of human history and the fascinating tapestry of cultures that have shaped our world. So, the next time you gaze up at the night sky, remember the Vedas, the Sumerians, and wonder, what could the ancients see that we've forgotten? Ever heard of a civilization that planned their cities with intricate precision, used standardized weights, and wrote in a script that remains undeciphered to this day? Welcome to the mystical world of the Harappans, who flourished in the Indus Valley around 5,000 years ago. This ancient society, one of the cradles of human civilization, was so advanced for its time that it continues to baffle modern historians and archaeologists. 
Today we dive into the remarkable story of this civilization, exploring their urban architecture, mysterious script, sudden disappearance, and even, dare I say, possible extraterrestrial connections. Sprouting around 3300 BCE, during what we now know as the Bronze Age, the Indus Valley Civilization, also known as the Harappan Civilization, was an oasis of advancement in an era when most of humanity was still dependent on hunting and gathering. Located in what is now modern-day Pakistan and northwest India, it was a civilization that would change the course of human history. The remarkable thing about the Indus Valley Civilization is its expanse. It spanned from the majestic foothills of the Himalayas all the way down to the warm waters of the Arabian Sea, covering more than a million square kilometers. It was not a small collection of towns or cities, but a civilization composed of over a thousand individual settlements. Some of these settlements were as far away as Afghanistan, showcasing the reach and influence of this ancient society. The two largest cities, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, were the main hubs of the civilization. These cities have offered the most significant evidence about the culture, lifestyle, and technological prowess of the Harappans. The range of artifacts, from terracotta toys to a wealth of intricate seals, found at these sites provides an insight into the complexity and diversity of this civilization. Moreover, the civilization was flourishing at a time when Egypt was still nurturing its first dynasties and the Sumerians were laying the foundation of Mesopotamia. The Harappans not only coincided with these civilizations, but were engaging in long-distance trade, as indicated by Mesopotamian artifacts found in Harappan cities and vice versa. This ancient network of trade is a testament to the Harappans' enterprising spirit and their role in the early development of international commerce. So, the Indus Valley civilization, with its vast expanse and technologically advanced cities, truly stands out in our human past as a beacon of the early urban revolution that laid the foundations for modern civilization. Few ancient civilizations can compete with the Harappans when it comes to urban planning and architecture. Their cities were laid out with remarkable precision, akin to a modern city's grid system. Main streets ran north to south, intersected at right angles by smaller east-west streets. The meticulous planning also extended to each residential block, where homes were arranged in a grid facing the streets with entrances to the side for privacy. Now consider this. These cities were established around 2500 BCE, a time when most of the world's civilizations were only just beginning to transition from nomadic to settled life. The Harappans not only mastered urban planning, but they also managed to implement it on a large scale throughout their civilization. A testament to their exceptional organizational skills, the architecture of the Harappan civilization was equally astounding. They built their houses, typically one or two stories, from uniform oven-baked bricks, a significant advancement from the sun-dried bricks used by contemporaneous civilizations. These houses were equipped with advanced features for the time, such as indoor bathrooms and sophisticated drainage systems, the presence of wells and bathrooms in almost every house, and the intricate network of covered drains indicate a deep understanding of hygiene and public health. In the midst of these residential blocks were larger public buildings and granaries, showcasing the communal aspect of the Harappan life. The Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro is a prominent example. This large, watertight, swimming-pool-like structure hints at ritualistic or communal activities, possibly even an early form of public sanitation. The Harappan's urban planning and architecture represent a culmination of societal cooperation, engineering prowess, and a deep understanding of urban living's needs. It was this extraordinary blend of science and society that set the stage for the world's first urban civilization. The Harappans left behind numerous inscriptions, etched primarily on seals, amulets, and pottery. These artifacts contained symbols forming a yet undeciphered script. Despite concerted efforts by linguists and historians, the Harappan script remains one of the last untranslated scripts of the ancient world. Containing about 400 distinct characters, many scholars believe this writing system is logosyllabic, a blend of phonetic and symbolic elements, like ancient Sumerian or Chinese scripts. The inability to crack the Harappan script isn't due to lack of trying but rather to a shortage of bilingual inscriptions, a tool that was pivotal in decoding ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. The absence of a Harappan Rosetta Stone 
has thus far kept the civilization's literature, if any, and many aspects of their culture tantalizingly out of reach. However, the Harappans did leave behind a system that we understand, their weights and measures. They used a binary decimal system for weights, with ratios of 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200 and 500. They used cubical weight measures made of chert, limestone, stertite, and a few of black basalt and red jasper, ranging from 0.856 g to 8735 g, evidencing a remarkable consistency and uniformity across a vast region. Measurements of lengths and masses reveal an amazing accuracy. They were capable of measuring angles, constructing geometric shapes, and aligning their architectural structures with cardinal directions. The meticulous precision of their measurements and the widespread use of standardized weights suggest a regulated economic and administrative system. While the Harappan script remains a puzzle, their weight system provides a fascinating insight into their society's structure and values. It underlines a highly developed sense of order, fairness and possibly an early form of taxation, once again underscoring the Harappan civilization's remarkable complexity and sophistication. As with many great civilizations, the decline and disappearance of the Indus Valley civilization presents a mystery that has baffled scholars for centuries. Around 1900 BCE, signs of gradual decline begin to emerge. The once meticulously planned cities show signs of dilapidation and less rigorous urban planning. Standardized weights and measures, the hallmarks of Harappan society were used less frequently, suggesting a breakdown in the system of centralized control. Several theories have been proposed for this decline, ranging from climatic changes to societal upheavals. Some scholars believe a major shift in monsoon patterns could have led to prolonged droughts, making agriculture, the backbone of the Harappan economy, untenable. Geological evidence suggests that devastating earthquakes and floods may have played a significant role too, as tectonic movements altered river courses particularly that of the river Saraswati, which vanished around the same time. Other theories propose the invasion of foreign entities, such as the Aryan people, as the root cause of the Harappan downfall. However, this theory has become less popular in recent years due to a lack of solid archaeological evidence supporting the existence of a large-scale conflict or mass migration. The gradual disappearance of the Harappan culture does not mean that it was completely erased. Elements of their practices and customs are believed to have been integrated into the cultures that succeeded them, particularly in areas such as craft-making and agrarian practices. In a way, the legacy of the Harappan civilization lived on, melding with the fabric of the subsequent cultures of the Indian subcontinent. Despite the mysteries that shroud the decline and disappearance of this ancient civilization, the Indus Valley civilization's footprint in history is undeniable. They showcased remarkable progress in urban planning, technology, and societal organization, setting a strong foundation that undoubtedly influenced the civilizations that followed them. Their legacy is a testament to human innovation and resilience, providing a fascinating glimpse into our shared past. The allure of the unknown often entices us to search for links between disparate civilizations and sometimes even to conjecture connections with extraterrestrial entities. The Indus Valley civilization, shrouded in mystery due to its undeciphered script and abrupt disappearance, provides ample ground for such speculations. One intriguing line of inquiry emerges from the numerous Indus Valley seals that depict what appear to be flying objects. These objects have been subject to various interpretations, with some suggesting a link to the ancient alien theory. Proponents argue that these depictions may indicate that the Harappans had contact with extraterrestrial beings. However, mainstream academia generally dismisses these theories due to a lack of concrete evidence and the likelihood of alternative, more plausible interpretations. In terms of inter-civilizational connections, there's intriguing evidence of contact between the Harappans and contemporary Mesopotamian civilizations. Archaeological findings have unearthed Harappan seals and jewelry in ancient Mesopotamian sites, indicating trade relations. Additionally, references to a distant country known as Milaha in Mesopotamian texts are believed by many scholars to refer to the Indus Valley civilization. Some researchers also suggest possible cultural and technological influences between the Harappans and the ancient Egyptians, another civilization renowned for its advanced engineering feats. However, 
While such connections are plausible, given the maritime capabilities of these societies, concrete evidence supporting this theory remains limited. Unraveling these potential connections is a captivating, yet complex pursuit. While these theories, particularly those involving ancient aliens, often venture into the realm of speculation, they underscore our fascination with the vast and complex web of ancient civilizations. As our understanding of the past continues to evolve, who knows what startling connections and revelations await us. As we take a step back and contemplate the Indus Valley civilization, it's not just their tangible achievements that mesmerize us, it's the aura of mystery surrounding their undeciphered script, the mystery of their abrupt disappearance, and the tantalizing possibility of connections with other ancient societies, and perhaps even extraterrestrial entities. But the true testament to their legacy is how they inspire us to constantly question, explore and strive to understand our shared human past. So next time you look at an urban grid or a piece of writing, take a moment to appreciate the journey of human civilization, a journey that's as exciting in its certainties as it is in its mysteries. Today we are journeying back in time to a civilization that has left a mark on our world, but whose true complexity is often overlooked, the Byzantine Empire. Positioned at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, the Byzantine Empire was a beacon of power, culture and innovation for over a thousand years. This was an empire that stood the test of time, outliving the Western Roman Empire by a millennium and bridging the gap between the ancient and medieval worlds. But what made the Byzantine Empire so good? What were its defining features and innovations? And how did it shape the world as we know it? Stick around and let's explore a little, shall we? The Byzantine Empire, known at the time as the Eastern Roman Empire, was essentially Rome's eastern continuation after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century. But why did it survive while its western counterpart crumbled? The answer, as it turns out, lies as much in geography as it does in strategy. The capital, Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, was a city ripe with advantages, built by Emperor Constantine in 330 CE on the site of the ancient city of Byzantium, hence the name Byzantine. It was situated at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. This strategic location on the Bosporus Strait allowed it to control the key trading routes linking the east and the west. Imagine having a doorway that leads to two different worlds, and you're the one holding the key. But it wasn't just about geography. The empire's success lay in its ability to adapt and evolve. As the Western Roman Empire fell into decay, the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine, embraced a more flexible administrative system. It had a more stable economy, supported by a complex system of taxation and a thriving trade network, both land-based and maritime. Moreover, the Byzantine Empire was more defensible. The city of Constantinople was surrounded by water on three sides, and its landward side was protected by massive walls, known as the Theodosian Walls. These walls were one of the most complex fortification systems ever created, and they kept the city safe from numerous sieges for hundreds of years. So you see, the Byzantine Empire's survival was not a product of luck or chance. It was a result of strategic location, robust trade, flexible governance, and formidable defences, elements that helped it navigate the turbulent waters of history for more than a thousand years. The Byzantine Empire has left us with a rich architectural legacy a testament to their advanced engineering skills and artistic flair. Their architectural style was unique, blending elements of Roman, Greek and Eastern designs into a distinctive Byzantine aesthetic. But it was more than just an amalgamation of styles, it was a creative fusion, something new and entirely their own. Perhaps the most iconic symbol of Byzantine architecture is the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Originally constructed in the 6th century during the reign of Emperor Justinian, it was an architectural marvel of its time and it continues to amaze us today. Let's take a closer look. The Hagia Sophia, or Holy Wisdom, was the third church to occupy that site, the previous two having been destroyed in riots. But this was not just another church, it was designed to be the most magnificent church in the Christian world, a symbol of Byzantine power and piety. Its architects, Anthemius of Tralis and Isidore of Miletus, were not simply builders. They were physicists, mathematicians and engineers. 
The building's crowning glory is its massive dome, spanning over 31 meters in diameter and perched some 56 meters high. This was an engineering feat unparalleled in its time. The dome seems to float, thanks to the ingenious design that distributes the weight of the dome down into the building's solid piers through a system of pendentives and semi-domes. The interior is bathed in natural light filtering through the 40-arch windows around the dome's base, creating an ethereal effect that was said to symbolize the divine. Another architectural gem is the Basilica of San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy. Built in the 6th century, it's known for its stunning mosaics depicting various biblical scenes and figures, including Emperor Justinian and Empress Theodora. These mosaics are not just decoration, they're storytelling in glass and stone, reflecting the Byzantine belief in the interconnection of church, empire and heaven. The Byzantines also excelled in fortification architecture, as seen in the walls of Constantinople, which successfully defended the city for centuries. These walls were a complex system of inner and outer walls, moats and towers, demonstrating the Byzantines' deep understanding of defensive strategy. So, when we speak of Byzantine architecture, we are talking about structures that were not only aesthetically striking, but also technically innovative and symbolically charged. They were built to inspire awe, to convey power and faith, and to stand the test of time. And stand they have, as enduring monuments to a civilization that fused art, science and spirit in stone and mortar. If we gaze back into history, we find that many of the works of ancient scholars would have been lost to time if not for the Byzantine Empire. But how did the Byzantines, situated in a world of constant change and upheaval, manage to preserve these invaluable texts? The Byzantine Empire was the heir to the Hellenistic world, Greek was the language of the empire and so they were the direct inheritors of the rich tradition of Greek literature, philosophy and science. And yet this alone doesn't explain their dedication to preserving these texts. The Byzantines had a deep reverence for the ancient Greek scholars. They saw themselves as the guardians of this knowledge, with a cultural and almost sacred duty to protect and preserve these texts for future generations. This reverence was reflected in their educational system, which placed a heavy emphasis on the study of ancient Greek texts, including Homer, Aristotle and Plato. Byzantine scholars painstakingly copied these ancient works by hand. They created beautifully crafted manuscripts, often embellishing them with intricate illustrations and ornate decorations. These manuscripts were stored in monastic libraries and other repositories across the empire, some of which survived the empire's fall in 1453 and are still standing today. But the Byzantines did more than just copy these texts. They also studied and commented on them, producing a rich body of scholarship that further enriched the original works. They explored the philosophical implications of Plato, the scientific theories of Aristotle, the medical observations of Hippocrates, and more. Furthermore, the preservation of classical texts wasn't limited to Greek works. Byzantine scholars also translated and preserved works from other cultures. For instance, they translated many works of ancient Persian literature into Greek, thereby saving them from oblivion. But perhaps the most consequential act of preservation was their transmission of these texts to the Arab world. During the Middle Ages, while much of Western Europe was in the so-called Dark Ages, the Arab world was experiencing a cultural and intellectual renaissance. Byzantine scholars played a key role in this renaissance by transmitting the works of ancient Greek scholars to the Arab world, where they were translated into Arabic and studied intensively. As we've journeyed through the Byzantine Empire's vibrant history, we've seen its strength, its wisdom and its cultural richness. But like all empires, it wasn't immune to the passage of time and the shifts of power that shape our world. So, what led to its downfall? The fall of the Byzantine Empire was not a sudden overnight event. Instead, it was a gradual process that occurred over several centuries, marked by both internal strife and external pressures. Internally, the empire was often plagued by political instability and succession crises. The Byzantine throne was not always inherited. It was often seized by force, leading to periods of chaos and infighting. This instability was further compounded by religious disputes such as the iconoclasm controversy we discussed earlier, which caused deep divisions within Byzantine society. Additionally, the empire's economy began to falter. High taxation, 
constant warfare and the loss of trade routes gradually drained the empire's wealth. This economic decline weakened the empire's ability to maintain its military defences and infrastructure. Externally, the empire faced numerous threats. To the east, the rise of Islam in the 7th century resulted in the loss of key eastern provinces such as Syria and Egypt. These territories were not only economically vital, but also culturally significant, and their loss was a major blow to the empire. Then, from the 11th century onward, the Seljuk Turks began to encroach on Byzantine territory. The empire called for aid from Western Europe, leading to the Crusades, which, while initially helpful, would eventually cause more harm than good. The Fourth Crusade in particular was disastrous, with the Crusaders sacking Constantinople in 1204 and establishing a short-lived Latin Empire in its place. The Empire would recover and re-establish itself, but the damage was done. The final blow came in the form of the Ottoman Turks. In 1453, after a lengthy siege, they captured Constantinople, marking the end of the Byzantine Empire. The city, renamed Istanbul, would become the capital of the Ottoman Empire. If we dive into the military aspect of the Byzantine Empire, we discover fascinating innovations and strategies that played a crucial role in its survival and dominance. The Byzantines, after all, didn't merely inherit the military traditions of Rome, they adapted and evolved them to suit their unique circumstances. One of the most iconic elements of Byzantine warfare was the theme system. This was a form of military and administrative organization that was instituted during the 7th century, as a response to the threats posed by the Arabs and the Persians, the empire was divided into several themes, or provinces, each overseen by a military governor. These governors would recruit soldiers from the local population, who were granted land in return for military service. This ensured that the empire had a steady supply of troops, and that these troops had a vested interest in defending their land. This system was not only innovative, but also remarkably effective, enabling the Byzantine Empire to defend its vast territories for centuries. In terms of weaponry, the Byzantines were famous for their use of Greek fire. This incendiary weapon was a closely guarded state secret, and its composition remains a mystery to this day. Greek fire, deployed from tubes or siphons, could continue burning even on water, making it a devastating weapon during naval battles. It was instrumental in several key victories, including the defence of Constantinople from Arab sieges. Byzantine military manuals, such as the Tactica of Emperor Leo VI, also demonstrate the Empire's advanced understanding of warfare. These manuals provided detailed instructions on tactics, formations, siege warfare, and even the use of various weapons. They indicate a level of strategic sophistication that was quite remarkable for the time. Finally, it's worth mentioning the Varangian Guard. This was an elite unit of the Byzantine army, composed primarily of Norsemen and later Anglo-Saxons. The Varangian Guard served as the Emperor's personal bodyguards and were renowned for their loyalty and their ferocity in battle. In conclusion, the military innovations of the Byzantine Empire were essential to its longevity and power. From the theme system to Greek fire, from comprehensive military manuals to the Varangian Guard, these advancements showcase the Byzantine Empire's adaptability and ingenuity in the face of evolving threats and challenges. They remind us that in the grand chess game of history, innovation can often make the difference between survival and extinction. And as what if I told you that alien technology is not just in the realm of science fiction, but potentially right under our noses? Some say governments around the world may have been collecting, studying, even reverse engineering extraterrestrial tech for decades. And what if we could trace this interaction all the way back to the Roswell incident in 1947, or perhaps even earlier? Let's delve into this fascinating world of UFOs, government secrets, and the tech that could be out of this world. Now the question that stands out like a sore thumb is, when did the government actually start collecting these unidentified flying objects? Uh, the timing seems to be a subject of considerable debate with some pointing as far back as the early 20th century. However, the watershed moment that brought UFOs into the public eye was undoubtedly the infamous Roswell incident of 1947. After the alleged crash of a UFO near Roswell, New Mexico, many UFO researchers and enthusiasts believe that the US government initiated a concerted effort to recover and study extraterrestrial technology. This is where things get murky. 
Official records deny the presence of any extraterrestrial artifact, explaining the incident as the crash of a high-altitude surveillance balloon. However, theorists and witnesses insist that there was a cover-up. The years that followed the Roswell incident saw an increase in reported UFO sightings, not just in the US but around the globe. Many believe this marked the beginning of covert government programs designed to acquire, study, and potentially reverse engineer extraterrestrial technology. Through the Cold War and the space race right into the 21st century, the narrative of governmental involvement with UFOs and potential alien technology has persisted. Enter Philip J. Corso, a name synonymous with the most famous alleged UFO incident in history. The Roswell Incident of 1947, Corso, a former U.S. Army colonel, shook the world with his claims in the book, The Day After Roswell. According to Corso, he was entrusted with foreign technology recovered from the Roswell crash. He alleged that the U.S. government had reverse-engineered this technology and then seeded it into the private sector, with Corso playing a pivotal role in the process. But what exactly was this foreign technology? Corso described artifacts such as a thin, clear material like plastic, reminiscent of the integrated circuits used in our modern computers. He also wrote of fiber optics, lasers, super tenacity fibers that led to the development of Kevlar and other advanced technology that was apparently far beyond human capability at the time. He even claimed that the Roswell craft itself was a kind of lifeboat for the alien crew and was designed to interface with them directly. Now. That's a thought to send chills down your spine, isn't it? A spaceship not just controlled by the creatures, but an actual part of them. However, skeptics have challenged Corso's claims, pointing to discrepancies in his accounts and citing the rapid pace of human technological advancement as a more plausible explanation for these innovations. But Corso's tale is just one piece of the puzzle. Let's dive deeper, shall we? Now, you might be thinking, if this is all true, why doesn't the government just come out and say it? Well, believe it or not, they kind of have. Over the past few years, government agencies, particularly in the United States, have been more forthcoming about the UFO phenomenon. In 2020, the US Department of Defense officially released three short videos showing unidentified aerial phenomena. These were captured by Navy pilots during training flights between 2004 and 2015. Each of the videos showcases fast-moving, oblong objects racing through the sky and performing maneuvers that seem to defy our understanding of physics. The government's acknowledgement of these videos as real, unidentified objects is a big deal. It's the closest we've come to an official admission that there are things in our skies that our best military and scientific minds can't explain. Then, there's the Pentagon's UAP task force, established in 2020 with a mandate to investigate sightings of unexplained aerial vehicles by military personnel. So while they're not saying, hey, we've got aliens, they're certainly saying, hey, there's something weird in the sky and we don't know what it is. But this acknowledgement doesn't tell us what these unidentified objects are, where they come from, or who, or what, is controlling them but it's a step towards transparency that was unthinkable even a decade ago. Could it be possible that this is a slow, calculated strategy to prepare us for something bigger, to acclimate us to the reality of the unknown? Perhaps. But for now, we're left with more questions than answers. So, let's explore further. After all, the best is yet to come. But how long have governments been aware of this alien phenomenon? And when did contact supposedly occur? Let's delve into that. According to some researchers and theorists, contact with extraterrestrial life may have started much earlier than we think. Reports of sightings and encounters date back centuries, with many ancient civilizations attributing their advancements to the sky gods. But when we talk about modern times, things start to get a bit more concrete, albeit still largely speculative. Some theorists point to the events of 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico as a significant turning point. They claim that a crash involving an extraterrestrial spacecraft occurred and that the US government recovered debris and even alien bodies. If this is true, then governments have been in contact with alien technology and potentially aliens themselves for over seven decades. But perhaps more interestingly, some whistleblowers and researchers argue that direct purposeful contact has been established between humans and extraterrestrial beings. Former Canadian Minister of Defence Paul Hellyer publicly stated in 2005 that not only do UFOs exist, 
but that governments have been in direct contact with extraterrestrials for many years. He even goes so far as to say that at least four species of aliens have been visiting Earth for thousands of years. Similar claims have been made by others, suggesting that this contact has resulted in a wealth of shared technology and knowledge, much of which remains top secret. If these assertions are correct, then we are dealing with a global, multi-generational cover-up with implications that would shake our society to its very core. But why would the government keep such world-altering information secret? Well, let's take a look at some potential reasons. Now, let's talk about possibilities. What are the potential technologies we could imagine extraterrestrial beings to have? And which of these might governments potentially have access to? For starters, let's consider the obvious, spacecraft technology. We're not just talking about sleek aerodynamic designs that defy gravity. These technologies could potentially involve manipulation of space-time itself. Ideas such as warp drives, teleportation devices and wormhole generators are all part of this speculative discussion. If such technologies are within the grasp of extraterrestrial civilizations, it could explain the seemingly impossible maneuvers reported in many UFO sightings. Then there's energy technology. It's no secret that we're facing an energy crisis on Earth, but an advanced alien civilization may have already solved this issue. Technologies that allow for harnessing energy from stars, otherwise known as Dyson spheres or Dyson swarms, or even directly tapping into the fabric of space-time for limitless energy, are all within the realm of theoretical possibility. And what about medical technology? Some abductees claim to have been healed or altered by their alien captors. Could we see advanced medical equipment capable of rapidly healing injuries, curing diseases, or even halting the aging process? But perhaps most interesting is the possibility of communication and information technology that could provide access to an interstellar internet, connecting civilizations across the galaxy or even the universe. This could potentially give us access to a wealth of knowledge beyond anything we've ever imagined. Of course, these are all speculative. We're still waiting on solid proof. But if even one of these technologies is real and within our reach, it could entirely reshape our civilization. And here's where things get a little tricky. You might be wondering, if the government does have such revolutionary technology, why keep it hidden? There are a few theories, really. For starters, any new technology that offers a significant strategic advantage is likely to be kept secret, especially in the context of national security. If these technologies can be weaponized, it would be natural for governments to want to prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. Moreover, disclosure could lead to social, economic and religious upheaval. Imagine the societal impact of realizing we're not alone in the universe or the economic consequences of introducing free, limitless energy. We could be looking at a complete restructuring of power and wealth, something those currently in power might not be too keen on. Then there's the potential for panic. In 1938, a radio broadcast of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds led to widespread fear among listeners who believed an actual alien invasion was underway. This incident has often been cited as an example of the mass hysteria that could result from the sudden revelation of extraterrestrial existence. Finally, consider that the governments might be suppressing the information not for our protection, but because they're being instructed to by the extraterrestrials themselves. Maybe the aliens don't believe we're ready for such revelations, or they might have their own reasons for wanting to stay in the shadows. All in all, these considerations paint a complex picture of the potential reasons for the suppression of alien technology. But remember, these are just theories. Until there is official disclosure, we can only speculate, conjecture, and ask ourselves, what if? So, there you have it. Philip J. Corso's detailed assertions about back-engineering alien tech from Roswell and the intriguing timelines of government interactions with UFOs. Could it be that we've had access to interstellar technology for decades? And if so, what's been holding back the big reveal? Food for thought, isn't it? As always, thanks for watching and remember the truth is out there, or is it?